Okay, we're recording. This is good. So welcome everyone. I'm so glad you're here. So um, <clears throat> I will keep letting people in the waiting room as they show up. I, um, oh, I'm not as organized as I usually am. So I have a couple of housekeeping things to um, tell you really quickly. Most of you look like regulars, so you're used to this. So um, if you're not muted, mute yourself. If you, the camera, you can have on or off. We do love seeing your smiling faces, though I will say. <laughs> so you all look beautiful. Um, and up in the top right-hand corner of your screen, if you're not used to the whole Zoom thing, I really suggest putting it on um, speaker view so that you can get, really see Julie. Um, so, and I will introduce her in just a second. I wanna tell you all, this is our eighth class for the Curious Musician. Um, it's the last one we're doing in this series. And then hopefully if all goes well, we'll start another series end of January um, and do it. I think it's been fabulous. I've had the most fun doing it. We've had the best clinicians. And so, and the reason we did it, those of you guys that are regulars, you know, we just noticed in the violin shop that all of our favorite adults that were used to playing in community orchestras and chamber music, that all of a sudden all their rehearsals were canceled, all their gigs were canceled, all their, everything was canceled. And they just started losing their mojo. They got sadder and sadder. They would come in and they'd say, oh, I haven't really touched my violin, you know? And so we said, decided we needed something to kind of, um, keep everybody really enjoying and loving their instruments. So that's what this came from. If you have ideas for clinics for our next session, please email me at huffmakerviolins.com, go on our website and just fill out the little thingy. Um, I could use it. I know we're gonna do one on vibrato. I'll find somebody fabulous for that. So speaking of somebody fabulous, oh, and tell your friends if they miss this, it will be on YouTube. I'll try and have it up by tomorrow. We'll see how fast I am this time, so. Um, so speaking of fabulous, like I tell you every time, my favorite thing about the classes for the curious musician is I get to hire all my favorite people in the world. <laughs> and, so, and this is super cool because tonight we have extra special awesomeness. So Julie Rossiter is an amazing musician, an amazing teacher, and we go way back way back we went to Brevard Music Center together I think we went to Governor's Honors Program together like all state you name it so and um and lo and behold she brought her wonderful friend and my friend too Elizabeth Alvarez can we call you Liz or Elizabeth which we prefer Liz, Liz is good Liz, Liz, Elizabeth will sound very strange coming okay <laughs> this is good Liz was all we did GHB together I know we did all state together all state, yeah you know? and that. so we, we're all the same age that, you know, that was maybe 10 years ago that we did all that, right? Yeah, about just that. about. Yeah, you said this like that. Yeah. So, um, so I am going to turn it over to Julie and Liz. And um, if you have questions, put them in the chat box and, and I'll monitor it and we'll throw it at them. Welcome, ladies. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. First of all, I want to say thank you to Huffmaker Violins and to Anna and to this amazing community because this is how we all get better. It doesn't matter if you're a professional or if you're an amateur or whatever, like the, the more we help each other and the more we like, the more we collaborate, the better we all are. So he, we're here tonight to talk about the bow. Um, I find that throughout my, and you guys probably all agree with me. I, I know you, we're all string players. When you're first starting out, we put a lot of focus on left hand. It's all about the left. Everybody is worrying about the, the intonation and your left hand and how you're holding. Well, that's great. That is perfect. And I thought Elizabeth, uh, Liz said to me the other day, she was talking to us, our classes. She, she and I teach together. We, um, I teach at Lambert High School, started the program in, in Forsyth County. And Liz is my, the other half of my brain. She um, she helps me with so many things, uh, directing the orchestra. She directs our chamber music program there. And tell them what you said about the bow as opposed to the, the left hand, the right hand versus yeah. the left hand. Well, it just so happens I, I had my four more advanced private students all had bow things going on that particular day. And I was doing some exercises with them. 
and I differentiated left hand with right hand, that the left hand is the what of, of our dialogue. And the right hand is how, how do we say it? So when we say no, 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 you know, those are all different ways to say the same thing. So it's just, you know, parallel that to our playing, we can play G all day long, but we can play it a hundred different ways and more because of our right hand, not because of our left hand. Right, so we're here tonight to talk about the how and just to give you more tools in your toolbox to be able to, to come at this so many different ways. So um, Anna was kind enough to poll everybody and ask, you know, hey, do you have any questions? What kinds of things can we talk about that will be helpful to you? So we're gonna kind of go down the list of, of some of these questions. The first thing, oh, and I'm a violist, by the way. Um, Liz plays violin and viola. We played in a quartet for 20 years together. Um, <laughs> and, and I do I do teach all of the stringed instruments, but I kind of came in the back door as far as teaching public school. So um, I had a private student and I did her a favor. She wanted to start a strings club and I was a professional like freelancer, taught private lessons. And I said, yeah, yeah, I'll help you, cool. And it accidentally, I have become now an orchestra teacher and it's wonderful and it's really exciting, but my strengths are definitely on the viola. So um, there are a lot of very universal things as far as bow hold and relaxing and things like that that we're gonna talk about. But if there are any specifics for cello and bass that Anna wants to jump in on, she's absolutely, you know, she can meet me anytime. So, <laughs> all right. So the first question that, that's popped out to me when we were looking over this poll of all of you guys um, was what's the perfect bow hold? Is there a perfect bow hold? How should we approach doing that? And some of you play are, are much more advanced, but generally the rule is there is no perfect bow hold. We're all shaped a little bit differently. The most perfect bow hold is one that is relaxed. Um, the, the idea, we play these instruments that are like the most unergonomic thing ever. I mean, this is not natural. Um, the things we do with our body is not always that natural when we're playing string instruments. So we want to make things as relaxed and as efficient as possible. So whenever I'm starting, whenever I'm teaching a bow hold, the first thing I say is, you gotta fit the bow into your relaxed hand. So when you're starting out, you know, you're just shaking your hand out. You're noticing, notice how your fingers fall. After you shake your hand out and you're relaxed, and they're not, this, your fingers but, don't fall like that. Yeah. Your fingers don't fall like yeah. that. Somewhere in between. There's a little bit of yeah. space between the fingers. And from there, we just work on fitting the bow into your relaxed hand. So when you start off, um, we have students generally just hold the bow, support it with your left hand. And then you're going to just kind of drape your fingers over the stick. We bend our thumb just a little bit because that will help us control what wit, lane you're in generally, but the fingers are simply going to fall over the top of the instrument. That first main knuckle set is it, from the hand is right. where we're looking at. And yeah, if, let me see if I can get closer here. So as I'm putting my bow into my hand, into my relaxed hand, my thumb is bending just a little bit. My first finger is touching kind of on the middle joint. These two fingers are Kind of dangling their feet in the pool, you know, hanging over the side, and pinky goes on the top. If you are a, a violist or a violinist, if you are a cellist, that the pinky is is a, is straighter. It's, it doesn't sit up on the top. It's it's a relaxed situation. We try to work on keeping your hand as level as possible. There are different schools of thought about this as well. Some people come with a little bit more pronated approach. For me, um, especially as a violist, just having a, a, the back of my hand be level with my forearm helps me get the weight from my arm into my hand and, and create a nice 
kind of balance there. Nice relaxed weight. Um, getting away from this, from even holding the stick. If any of you have ever been to a rock and roll concert, I know I have. Um, if you ever look in the audience, especially guys, they um, everybody loves to do like the air guitar thing that you know. Um, if you've ever been to a concert and you see people or, or you're at a stoplight, um, I know it's happened to me a few times sitting at intersections, I hear a great concerto and I'm air bowing like crazy. I find with my classes, it's a really super way to get people just to get relaxed a little bit. Like, don't worry about what you look like so much and, and let yourself move a little bit. If you're playing and you're just like kind of opening up and just jam out, let your, let your wrist relax a little bit. Um, the relaxation helps you not only open up your sound, but just to kind of get things loosened up, even gonna, before you pick up the stick. And I'm gonna point out, you actually don't do what you were doing with an air bow. Notice that her hand is not stiff this way. It's letting, it's sort of painting back and forth right. so that you have that connection and smoothness of, the change of the direction. I like the way um, Liz was saying the paint because I had a teacher, uh, they used to talk about the bow hand like a paintbrush. So your fingers are the bristles and your hand and your wrist are like the, the handle of the paintbrush. So when you're painting a wall or something like that, as you're, as you're painting, the wrist sort of leads and then the fingers follow, like as if you're using a paintbrush. If you were to kind of jam the paintbrush into the wall and push up, you would have a really messy painting or a wall. Um, the fingers follow the flow and the direction of the wrist. So the more relaxed you are, it doesn't mean you have to be so loosey goosey that you can't hang on to the bow, but let your, your wrist lead a little bit. And then the fingers sort of react and they follow. So um, for those of you, and I myself am, am a bit of a control freak. Um, and I have worked with lots of adults who, you know, we all want to do stuff really well. I don't want to, I don't want to play unless I can win. I, I like to play well. I don't actually, I don't care if I win, but I want to look good when I'm doing stuff. Um, and I find that when I'm, when I'm worried about that, when I'm worried about being bright and being er, everything well, look what exact, she just did. Tighten it up, tension. right? So if I want things exactly right, I tend to get a little bit more uptight about things. So as you're approaching your bow hold, and I fixed things over the years, even after I was, you know, getting multiple degrees, I had to change some things in my bow hold. Um, I think the most important thing is if you want to, you want to change something, you want to feel like I, I know I'm too tight, I know I'm too tense and I want to relax, you have to allow yourself to feel kind of, you have to allow yourself to feel crappy <laughs> about it. It's got to feel, um, it's going to be uncomfortable at first. It's not going to feel right because you're not used to doing it that way. So you sort of have to allow yourself to get used to something feeling uncomfortable and practice it a little bit and, and allow yourself for it, you know, to not feel great initially. And then you work on, you know, breathing and then step away from it come back to it, um, back to holding the bow. As you, as you put your bow into your relaxed hand, it's often easier to start on the side because we don't have to, you don't have to tighten up to hold anything. And I generally have students just kind of slide in to the notch there on the, at the end of the frog. And that, that helps me get started holding the bow. Well, and so a couple of points that Julie has, has made I want to expand on a little bit. One, in terms of there is no one bow hold, that it's it's your bow hold. One of the things that I would recognize, it took me a while because I, I have very long hands, very long fingers. And when I first was learning, it was, oh, you have to do this bow hold. You know, it has to be this certain way. I have double joints. I've, I've got just a funky, wonky hand. And I basically got to the point where I had to ignore what I was being told and let my hand do what was natural for it. And I would highly recommend the idea of, of that concept from 
letting, letting your body do what it needs to do to be comfortable. If you have tension, you will be uncomfortable and you will cause harm to yourself. Um, but with that said, know that if you have a shorter, more compact kind of hand, even what uh, Julie was suggesting, you might be closer to the tips of your fingers versus the palm of your hand. For me, I, I get really close to my palm and I still have inches hanging over the, the, the stick because I just have long fingers and that's how it is. If I had this kind of uh, more pronated type of, of grip, even if it's uh, bent, I feel very, uh, insecure about how I can control the stick and, and be relaxed at it at the same time. The other, and to that point, so when you're, if you are adjusting at all your bow grip to Julie's point, it's going to feel uncomfortable. Not because you have been doing anything wrong or right. It's your muscle, different. there's a muscle memory issue going on. Your hand knows what it feels like, just like when you brush your teeth. I tell, this is what I tell Matt, go brush your teeth with your left hand or the opposite hand of what you used. And you will discover that you have to think about it. You know, now you don't have to do it because you brush your teeth with that hand and, and it's all well and good. The same thing's going to happen here. If you make any kind of adjustment, you have to give yourself time, your, your muscles time to learn it. And that may take a day, a week, a month. So patience and, and just willingness to feel, feel, recognize that being uncomfortable is progress. Right, right. There was a, um, there was a guy when I was at, at Indiana University there was a teacher there who was a jazz icon, David Baker. And in the practice building, there were three floors and then in the top floor is where all the jazz would practice. And um, Dave Baker would literally, he would lurk in the hallways where the practice, where the kids are practicing. And he would just listen outside people's practice rooms and when someone was particularly struggling through a passage, like a saxophonist, or you know, somebody was working and they were messing up and they were working and they were messing up, he would fling open the door and go, you sound bad, that's good. And he'd shut the door and walk off. <laughs> but you know, the great thing about that is you should sound, you know, it should sound bad first. You gotta allow yourself to do that and then you can move forward. Um, give yourself that. That's, that's your gift to yourself. And then, then as you go forward, then, then you kind of can relax a little bit. That makes it easier. Um, along the same lines with the relaxation, um, one of the, the first things I do, besides just getting the hand on the stick and, and relaxing that way, is just mm -hmm. practice raising your shoulders all the way up to your ears and then stop and then drop them. Um, we hold so much tension. Even... From, our, yeah, our muscles, just, just this, yes, we use these muscles. So relaxing this helps relax this and moving forward like that. So just kind of remind yourself what relax feels like. Um, there are some questions in here about um, full bow, straight bow, keeping your bow parallel to the bridge, things like that. So let's talk about those things next. Um, one of the best exercises I've found for keeping your bow straight, and of course, as you align your instrument, as you're practicing, you want to make sure, um, I always use the mirror because our ang the angles are so weird on your instrument that if you're looking straight down your fingerboard, what looks straight is not straight. So to angle yourself so that you are facing your or, uh, perpendicular to the mirror or you're parallel to the mirror with your instrument, um, it will help you kind of line up and then you can figure out what, what the, where the angles are. Um, when I first start off, I, I try to make sure that I do have, that the stick is parallel to the bridge, but I'm also creating kind of a little box here with the top part of my instrument. Um, so that's how you, that's how you kind of situate yourself. Again, put your put your bow down for a second because I'm about to show you something that changed okay. a lot of what I do with, with my students. We call this the rub. The rub is basically this. You're gonna put your left hand, hand straight out, straight out like this. Take your right hand, put it on top of your arm, like right at your elbow. And you're gonna practice rhythms going down bow, up bow, 
So if we were to play, um, ba da dum, ba da dum, be da dum, you would do. Like Brandenburg, whatever whatever um, tune you want to play, as you start working on like whatever music you're working on, you have a piece you want to play. Do this first: arm, left arm straight out, right arm right. this way. So the arm is where your fiddle would be. Yeah, and you're creating the the rub, that kind of swishy sound with with the friction of your arm. What you are doing with this is absolutely amazing because you're already you're automatically isolating the muscles and the, the parts of your arm that you need to in order to to do have a straight bow. Most of the problems that we have with getting the, the bow gets crooked is the shoulder or the upper arm gets too involved and we pull it out of out of alignment. So if I'm using the top part of my arm, my bow is getting crooked. But if I'm using moving from the elbow down I'm isolating a little bit more. Now, does this mean your shoulder is, is frozen and doesn't move at all? No, but the motion doesn't start with your shoulder. The motion is coming from the elbow down. So it, the shoulders, you know, you're relaxed, but, but you, the, that rub exercise with whatever piece, you can take your orchestra music and go through and create that sound first. Um, and, and what we think of, it's funny because when I started doing this, I've always thought of my arm being more side to side when I bow, but it's really actually not. If you're holding your instrument this way, you're really coming out more, more forward than you are side to side with your arm. And when you start thinking about it like in that way, it, it helps you control the, uh, the straightness of your, of your bow. So thinking from the elbow down, if you start with an exercise like this, it's going to simplify everything. It's so much easier when you get your bow into your hand on the string. Yeah, I just wanted to just jump in and say for our cellists and bass players that what they were talking about in terms of um, the lower half of your arm, same thing for us. Say if you get that shoulder too involved, yeah. it screws everything up. So um, our directions, of course, are a little different That's for the rub, but, I, right. but right. the rub is still so great. I'm still totally going right. to feel that. Right. Right. <laughs> because it isolates. It, it puts the onus on the elbow. Yeah, and so yes. you, you, and, and you, because, because your hand is, is fixed on your arm, so you can only move at your elbow. Yeah, I mean, I mean maybe you move you at your this. shoulder, then you're moving your whole body kind of thing. So yeah, yeah, yeah. it forces the issue. So that's the first tool that, that is so easy. Like before you even do anything, look at your orchestra music and get your arm out and just do that first. Then pick up your instrument. You'll you'll be amazed at how much straighter your bow is without doing very much of anything. Um, the next exercises that I want to show you are the things that have been the most helpful for me as far as extending the bow. We had a lot of questions about how do I keep my bow straight all the way down? How do I play with a longer bow? Things like that. Um, and these are some exercises that I have found extremely helpful for myself and for my for my students. Um, there is a, a technique called Cole, C-O-L-L-E. Um, and it is basically a way of extending your fingers with the bow. Um, just at the very end, without without doing anything else, it's a, a way of giving yourself like just that little bit more in the bow without having to do anything fancy with your arm. Um, so when you practice, there are, there's like different levels of practicing this, this motion. And all it is, is in your relaxed bow hand, you are simply extending, extending your fingers and then bringing your bow back towards your palm or bringing your fingers back to your palm, like bringing them in. So starting curved, extending, and then coming back. When you start with this, um, when you start this motion, the first thing that you are going to do is you're gonna start it just simply holding your bow with your left hand. You're gonna place your fingers on the bow. However, you know, if you're cellist, 
you're gonna have a straighter pinky, but we're gonna start, you're supporting the bow with the left hand and you are simply going to keep your thumb bent, but you are going to extend those fingers and then come back, extend, come back. So you're going a little bit out, maybe turn it to the so that the frog is so help me. Okay, yeah. like this. So my pinky, especially, you can see how it's it's straightening. The fingers are extending like that. Um, you start off with this, this exercise, supporting the bow with your left hand. The next step is to do the same uh, stroke, but do it on a pencil, not with a pencil, but on a pencil. We're gonna hold the pencil and you're gonna put the bow at three different parts of the bow. We, we can start at the frog. You're gonna put the bow on a pen or a pencil and do the same thing. Like that. Then you're gonna move to the middle of the bow. And I just have the hair flat. I don't curve my stick, I turn my stick away too much. Just keep the hair flat, keep your fingers relaxed. And again, you do extend and come back and concentrate on keeping your thumb kind of bent. That will help you control the side to side where, where your bow is, what lane your bow is on your string. Um, again, extend like this, and then you're going to move to the tip, same thing. And you can do it as many times as you need to get comfortable. Once you're comfortable with this, then you put the instrument up and you do the same type of motion. The, the thumb does stay bent, but you will have this, this type of motion where you start off with curved fingers. Doesn't have to sound pretty. It just needs to be a short, it can be a very, um, short motion, you want to use, this motion starts with the fingers. It does not start in the arm. You do not move your wrist on this. This is a very much an isolation of, of the fingers. Um, very often I will have a, a student rest their arm on top of either a chair or something like that. So they're really, that kind of, stroke so you're controlling you're isolating just the just the fingers these are the um this is the way that you are going to allow yourself as you get to the ends of the bows where you think you're just about out of everything you got you've got just a little bit more to add either at the tip or at the frog it will help you keep your bow straight because you don't have to do anything fancy with your arm to make make things stretch out the extra bit of finger that you have that ha have at the top or the bottom of the bow will open you up and allow you to have a little bit more more room to move. Um, once you have once you've exercised once you've done this at the frog and the middle and the tip, then you're going to start to put this this um, exercise into play a little bit more. So you can start with a down bow and then you add a little up bow at the very at the very tip. So you can play. <laughs> Like that, just adding a little bit more of a stroke at the ends of your bows. That will help you kind of make it as, as connected as possible um, and, and just give you that little bit extra at the ends without changing the angle of the bow. Right, and so when we are now, but then you say, you might say, well, that's great, but I still don't have a straight bow. So a few things to be aware of, and as, as Julie was pointing out, it's that box when she was first making, you've got that box that you want to create to have that straight bow. If when we are pulling our bow across the fingerboard or it's otherwise doing any kind of curvature, again, that's, that's the shoulder that's in, in motion versus our elbow. And you can see how much, I mean, I'm exaggerating, of course, greatly just to be able to do that. And, um, 
Yeah, this is the teacher chair. Well, don't yeah. you know? <laughs> so when if if I'm I mean, I'm exaggerating, so you can really see how that's going. That's all about my shoulder motion. As soon as I isolate my shoulder and move it back and forth, it's more straight. One of the things that I, I I've done this off and on when I feel like I'm I'm not getting that extension, and it kind of goes with it. it um, I, I'm doing what Julie was talking about with the collé, um, but applying it in a different way, so that I am starting at the frog and just placing it. And, and I will do this in a mirror so that I can really tell how, how well I'm straight or not. And I'm very mildly lift or not, not very much, you know, just half an inch or just enough not to touch the strings, move my bow all the way down and then stop at the tip so that it's, it's air bow basically. And you're doing it slowly. It's a great control exercise because you don't have to worry about what you're playing. I'm holding my instrument on the, on the ribs. And it's just about, because the, the nice thing about being adult is that we can analyze and try to break it down into pieces of what, what the heck is going on? What do I need to look at? So I'm starting at the frog and I can make it faster and doing it. And then the goal is this kind of thing where you're just doing it a little bit faster. And then, and you're, because you're going to be talking, you're, you're concentrating on two things. You're concentrating on the straightness of your bow, and that's more of a visual. You're watching yourself in the mirror, and you're keeping an eye on the tip and the frog, but you're also being very conscientious of isolating your elbow so that when you're moving up and down, you still have that straight. So even, you know, I'm, I've got, I'm not holding my violin up properly, but um, you can see that my bow, even air bow, is straight going back and up. And that's because I've got the isolation just you know, back to the rub that we were talking about at the beginning, just this kind of motion. There's another thing that, that will help if you're, you're trying to use your full bow and keep your bow straight, you can let your instrument help you too. It's not just about the right hand. It's about letting your, here we go, our, our rotation again. Um, it's, it's about, letting your instrument move with you. There's a lot of contrary motion that can happen that can help you, A, sustain your sound when you get to the top or the bottom of the bow, but um, without having to change angles so much. So I always think about on down bows as sort of opening up, kind of broadening here. And letting my instrument, letting the scroll kind of come up a little bit. And then as I come to the frog, instead of feeling like I'm jammed up down here, I let my hands come towards each other, sort of like a hub. Now you don't want to be, you know, doing, we can do it with a grain of salt, but yeah, that's the idea. And I come in just a little bit at the frog. Notice how that's where I can curve my fingers a little bit. Like that. So it's, it's all kind of working together. As you start to feel like you're running out of room, then you're curving your fingers and you come in. So it's this kind of motion. And that helps with your sound quality as well as that opening up. If you've heard of Alexander technique or anything like that, it, that's, that's, promoting better posture and better openness, that, that sense of balance and all those, those other things that in the end, the result will be a better tone quality. And it's a way of, like, of not stopping the string mm -hmm. also. Um, when, you're, when you stop the string to go back and forth like this, our string, we spin it, it spins one way or the other. And so if you are creating kind of a feeling of being maybe on one side of the string a little bit and then moving on the other side as you change bows, it allows the string to still roll, right? And still spin and um, it keeps your sound ringing. Right, because as soon as you stop, you'll dampen the, the sound right? And it, and it kills it. Um, yeah, I just, can I just say that so many, when we were just talking about this this week with several of my friends and questions to ask you, they wanted to know how to look beautiful when you play like how to look graceful they say yeah yeah sound is good but how do i get that gorgeous look that was it right there were you all paying attention because that was it well you know it's funny because it's such a 
what we do is, I'm sorry if there's any band people in here, I'm, you know, I don't mean to offend, but God, we're way more fun to watch than wind players, right? They don't, you, they don't move very much. They don't have to. I mean, if you're trombone, yeah, but we, when we can do this and create, A, it, it just relaxes you more if you can move. But um, yeah, it does kind of create this, not maybe not a figure eight, but there's a, there's something that kind of flows with it and it, that helps. And, and think too about all, all that we do, regardless, you know, left hand, right hand, standing, sitting, all those different aspects of how we have to play our instrument. Think about good posture. You know, if we were sitting at, in a chair, you know, when we tell our kids, sit up straight, you know, you need to sit up straight. You need to sit on the edge of your chair. You need to have, you know, maybe be on the balls of your feet, depending on what you're doing yeah. to be, to have that energy, but not, if you're sitting like this, slumped over that a that looks painful and so it probably is painful but but there's you're com immediately pressing things keeping yeah. yourself from being able to you know how can you extend if you're all squunched up so just by standing sitting up standing up and having that posture especially across the shoulders that that just helps enormously because then you have room you've got room to extend your bow and do all the things that that you ultimately need to do. And that's one more thing. Um, when we were talking about letting your instrument help you, let the instrument mm -hmm. come to you or, or work with your bow. If you're worried about like having your bow get crooked, the first thing you should think about is where you, where's your instrument at this point? Because a lot of times we do, we pull in and we do things that we're not even aware of. So if you're just, if you even just open up your instrument, like open up your posture a little bit, sometimes that fixes a crooked bow more than anything. You're just, you know, do this, get your nose in the air a little bit. That, that tends to work wonders. So um, let me just throw in, I just wanted to say real quickly, you used the perfect word when you said, you said on Val and Viola, maybe it's not exactly a figure eight, but in cello and bass, we call it that a lot and we use it. So when we're down there, that figure eight is a beautiful analogy. It really helps us. So for it's our low true. strength people, yeah. think about That's that. That's very true. Yes, it's a much more ergonomic situation down there with the, the cellos. The That's that's because we get to hug our instrument. It's true. Yes. And that's how I feel like when I'm coming to the frog is sort of that kind of hugging feeling. Um, so yeah, we have a great question on the chat that's going to lead us into our next sort of uh, section. Um, I have a whistle quite often on the E string. What can I change with my bowing to help prevent this? When we use the bow, it is about three main items. The two primary ones are weight and speed. And the third is contact point or placement. And the proportion of weight to speed is going to create infinite tone quality results. So when you have that whistle on the E string, um, one, make sure that I should pre preface this by saying, make sure that your, your hair is properly rosined. If you have a, a slick spot on it, that'll, that'll sometimes start the whistle, but it's, there's not enough weight on the E string. And it's just a matter of kind of grabbing it a little bit. Um, so that if, if it's if it's airy, I can't now I can't I'm not gonna be able to do it because but if you um and even soft it's just a matter and probably um flatter hair depending on, on what you're playing and how you're playing it flatter hair will grab it a little bit better and you can hear that little tick and if you want smooth but it's a little bit more weight will help prevent that. I'm I'm primarily a violist and when I play the violin I have that problem a lot but when I hit the E string because probably because I'm thinking it's so much lighter and things like that I find that if I just think about sagging my elbow a little bit I mean you don't have to push you don't have to do anything but if I just think about like just sagging the elbow just mm -hmm. the tiniest bit I, I can get rid of that that whistly sound on the E string um, generally it's just you're too you've got more speed than weight Mm -hmm. at that at that point so um thinking about dropping your shoulder in or just sagging your elbow just the tiniest bit 
Um, that was another question. Um, somebody talked about viola making, you know, the weight in the in the string and things like that. Um, I guess I will use my one of my very favorite um, examples of making a sound on on an instrument, making a good sound. Um, I like to think of tone production like tug of war. You've ever, you've all been to your field days. Um, tug of war is where you pull the rope and you pull, and the two teams try to drag each other into the mud. Um, a, a perfect way of thinking about uh, tone production on a stringed instrument is you want to think about tug of war because what happens when you do tug of war? If you stand there and you hold onto the rope and you just go yank yank, the other team's going to drag you into the mud. But if you grab the rope and you kind of plant your feet and you lean and you pull, that's where the power is going to be. That's where the the the, the where your team's going to win. Um, when you apply this to a stringed instrument, the bow is kind of like your feet. You're gonna plant your feet. You're gonna feel a little crunchiness like that. And then you're gonna pull. You're gonna sink in and you're gonna pull. You're gonna lean. And that, that gives you the weight and the sound that you, you can use to create more volume, to create a thicker sound. Um, if you want to adjust your volume, then you're going to adjust the weight and the speed of the bow. So more, more weight, you can move the bow a little bit slower. More speed, you can lighten up with the bow. And, and honestly, they kind of work that way anyway. Right. If you're going really you, fast, you, yeah. you can't keep you, your you arm do it way down in the string. The, and the other thing is when talking about full bow usage, recognizing, of course, that the tip is lighter than the frog, both for the frog itself and the hand on top of the frog. So when we want to sustain, we've got to make sure that our weight stays constant all the way across as we're going. And that's gonna require you to press down a little bit on the stick with that forefront of your, of your hand to make sure that that weight stays constant. Otherwise, that's, that's when, you know, when you're in orchestra, they say, I need you more all the way through to the end of the measure. That's what's happening is that you're letting go of that weight that was at the in the lower half is disappearing in the upper half. Um, to, to Julie's point, one of the things that I, I have a, a huge soapbox uh, in my all, all my students they they would just laugh right now. But um, I am very passionate about likening vocalizing to the bow. Everything that we do with our bow, we can do. We you know if you want to figure out how to you want it to sound with your bow, say it. If you say a duh versus a buh versus a tuh versus a guh, all those little differentiations of the cons consonant are, are ways that we use the bow. If you want to sustain, are you sustaining because you're going ba da di or you're going ba da di? Those are, you, one has separation. You might be changing your bows. You might be stopping your bows. One is continuing. You might be legato all the way through or you're pulsing through the bow all those different kinds of things. So if you're not sure what you want it to sound like as you're working with your bow and instrument, stop, put them down and, and vocalize it, sing it or say it. And, you know, you, you can just say one, two, three, and you know, one and two and one and two, you know, whatever it is, but how you say it will come across, you'll know what you want to hear then. You'll know that you need to stop the bow, even if you haven't identified that you have to stop, but because you said it and you stopped because you had put a pause, you'll do the same thing with your with your bow. To that end, um, the other part is airflow. That's huge. So if I if if I, for example, talk like this because I am restricting my airflow, and I sound horrible when I say that. Of course, it's the same thing here. If I am going to have a very slow, so air. Airflow, air speed is the speed of the bow. So when I talk like this, it's a lovely sound, isn't it? But because my weight was too much for the speed, as soon as I let up on the weight, same speed, or conversely, go faster, same weight. So I can get better tone quality. That's the proportion that we're talking about. So I would encourage you to practice or you know, try out these different ways 
slow bow speed, fast bow speed, very lightweight, very heavyweight, and do all the permutations of those to see what happens, what kind of sound quality you get with a full bow, because you that weight issue, you know, if you start with this and it starts sounding nice, you know that you haven't maintained your weight all the way to the tip. You've you've released on that. So those are those are ways to figure it out. Yes. Um, so Liz, on the violin, do all four strings react the same to weight, or do you have to treat the different strings? See, on string bass, we have to treat all four strings completely different. But on mm -hmm. violin, is it are they more similar? Do you understand? Like more weight, they, less weight, more speed, less speed? They are more similar. The the G string is, I think, the one that we have to be at least the most careful about. With too much weight, we can start sounding like a sick cow if we do if we use too much. But um, and and the E string actually can take a lot of weight. Um, I, I find that lighter weight sometimes on the E string is the issue at hand versus uh, more weight because the, the more weight with that tiny little thin string, you, you need all the help you can get it for it to vibrate. And if you have light, not yeah, it's, it's that balance. Um, uh, you can get away with a slower speed on the E string than you can uh, if you have a slow speed on the G string and too much weight that's when you'll have that kind of pitch differentiation that occurs so i think also um we worry a lot about sounding scratchy mm -hmm. um i know with students of all ages well all of us oh, yeah. we 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 worry about sounding like that scratchy string player and so much of what we worry about is right under our ears. Um, so a lot of what you hear, if you're worried that you're, you're too scratchy on certain things, sometimes that's just surface noise. And that all, all of that doesn't carry. If you've got a relaxed weight in the string, I call it crunchy and fluffy. Um, like some sounds, it, you know, I, I talk to my viola students, like that's a little too fluffy for me. I, I want a little bit more crunchy. If you have a little bit of, of friction on the string, you feel that, and then you, then you pull, then you sink in and pull, you are still gonna hear some under your ear. Mm -hmm. That's okay. Like that doesn't carry more than, you know, a few, not even a foot. So if you're trying to project to a big audience, to have a little crunchiness, to hear a little surface noise, that's good. You should have a little surface noise. I can hear a lot of a lot of surface noise right now, but I I know that I am able to project a, a clearer sound because of that weight, because I'm pulling, because I'm sinking in. So just be aware of that too. Don't be so hyper aware that you're trying to make everything so nice that it won't project. So, um, the, and to, to her point about surface, you, um, another, thank you for that segue. All the flat hair versus, a, you know, a, a flat stick hair versus a tilted stick so that you don't, you're not using all of your surface area. Flat hair, we, we tend to learn and because we see it and we, we're uh, imitating it and, and even taught that way to have an angle with our stick as we're going. But a lot of times we want that flat hair. We want to get every square inch that we can possibly get, and especially on the faster notes. So if I that kind of noise, so it's tiny bow and all the surface area, and it, you'll hear that scratchy, you know, that kind of clicky kind of back and forth, and that's good. That's giving us articulation. It's making it uh, there's a clarity of sound that we produce. Very good. Um, also with sustaining, if you think about, you know, we, we all tend to lose a little bit of sound when we come to the tip. Mm -hmm. The bow gets lighter there. Um, it's helpful if you're trying to create a long sustained sound throughout your bow to think about NASCAR. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> what is so NASCAR, I, did you know that drive race yes. car driving and violin, you know, string playing is hand in hand. So the really good race car drivers, um, like everybody can drive really fast on the straightaway, but the, the race car drivers that tend to win that do the best are the ones that 
like when they come into the curves, when they come into the turnaround, they speed up. Everybody else is putting on their brakes like, uh-oh, I don't want to wreck, wreck my car. The ones who really know what they're doing are the ones that speed up on those turnarounds and then get ahead of everybody. They can pass them. So if you're thinking about, you know, the Jimmy Johnson or whoever, um, the success is in the turnaround, is the sustaining part. That's the important thing. So when you get to the ends of the bow, that's not where you slow down. That's where you kind of, you push it, like pedal to the metal there, baby. Just move towards the frog and or towards the, the tip and don't slow down. That will help you keep the sustained sound. If you're thinking, you can also think a crescendo a little bit just so you keep that sustained feeling. But if you're if you're trying to keep a sustained sound, um, don't slow down on the turnaround. Just keep the boat even and keep it flowing. The the fingers, the loose fingers, will help you kind of sustain that. But um, be be excited about like we're excited about the holidays. I'm excited about winter break. Um, as soon as when I am, can't wait for winter break. And, and I sort of think about when I'm trying to sustain my sound, like, I can't wait for this up bow. I can't wait for the down bow. Like, I can't wait to get there. You have to think like that when you do that. It, it will really help you keep your sound open and, and keep everything kind of ringing. And that's a, um, you can step away from the, the technique of that as well in terms of the music. So when she was saying, you know, we get to the next bow turn, where are you going musically? You know, that, that part of that is if you're going to the downbeat or you're going to the big beat of, of whatever, you know, how many, ever, however many beats or on the offbeat, are you, what kind of rhythm are you playing? All those things are going to play into how fast your bow is going. If you have half notes and quarter notes and eighth notes all in a, in a melodic line and you want a big, huge, full sound, you're going to be going slower on that half note because you need to more uh, mileage on that and you're going to have to move your bow faster on the eighth notes if you want that same level of sound. So understanding that speed, weight, proportion, again, comes into play there. Um, I'm trying to look through all these questions and see if I've if we've hit on a lot of them. And uh, we talked about the weight being in the arm or weight being in the string. Um, that's a a feeling of heaviness. I talk about being in the string all the time. Um, again, that's that's the shoulders up and let it go. Yeah, I'm feeling that 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 weight, that tug of war, kind of planting your feet and pulling kind of sound, leaning into the string. Because when you're, if you're tense, you're, you're reaching up almost, you're holding up. So you don't, your weight is, is not there. It's not hanging. And if you let it go, then it's, it's sagging. Think sag, you know? Yeah. Um, really good question here. How do you keep from getting tense when you're playing repeated bow strokes? We, we were working with um, with our students uh, a few a couple months ago on the Holberg suite. That's a oh, gosh. This, this pattern yes. that's just the and, and after a while, you know, it's really easy to short circuit. You know, your arms um, and it's, it's tiring. It's exhausting. So when I have and especially as a violist, we have a lot of repeated yeah. patterns over and over and over again. And aside from slipping into a coma, you also have the problem of being, you know, like you, it's easy to get tight. Um, I have to make a conscious effort and, and there's no really big secret. I, I physically make myself drop my shoulder. I physically think about like just relaxing my elbow. Now there are tons of schools of thought about where your elbow needs to be, how you know how you create the the weight in the string and the sound. But I have found for me um, that relax. And I I started off like this kind of this kind of stroke where my my bow was very rigid and I had a very straight arm, but I had also a lot of tension in my bicep and in my shoulder. And as soon as I let go just the tiniest bit, like an inch, it was amazing what that did for me, how, how I was able to, to accomplish so many more things just because of that little inch of just relaxation. So 
if you're getting and you're in a repeated pattern over and over again and you are you feel like you're gonna die you feel like your arm's gonna fall off the first thing you need to do is just let go of your elbow a little bit mm -hmm. just let it sag for just all you that's all you do you don't have to do anything else just let go a little bit and then yeah well and and to that that this is this is the the chamber music person in me speaking as well so i'm the second violinist in our quartet and so like the violists we get a lot of the same going on and or re, re, that repetitiveness and i find it is very helpful to be listening to everybody else unless my part <laughs> right because suddenly i'm playing with my yeah. my mates and supporting them and whatever the melody is or you know whatever is important at that particular moment and so i'm not worried i.e tense about my part because I am concentrating on their part and doing what I need to do. And so they might be crescendoing and then, you know, they're, they're doing all these sorts of phrases that go up and down in terms of volume or, or you know, all those kinds of things that I'm watching their bow speed. If we have like uh, rhythms and things like that. So when you're matching as much as possible, supporting what they're doing, you know, part of it is distracting yourself from the point of view of what, <laughs> what's going on be, and but it get there are moments of relaxation and that you acquire because of that other player right right so so knowing what the music is you know that there's a and you don't have to be watching them you're just, you're listening yeah. while you're looking at your music um that that also is when i was growing up and i still get nervous i, I was the poster child for nerves and i don't know if any of you have ever experienced the the jittery bow and the, the tension that, that nervousness creates. Um, I had a really hard time with that. And two things that helped me, one was what Liz was just talking about. Stop thinking about me, <laughs> start thinking about the music or what else is going on in the music helped, helped a lot. And also breathing, like just mm -hmm. blowing out mm -hmm. through your mouth will help you a great deal, especially in those patterns where you're just dying. You're like, oh my gosh, my arm's going to fall. If you will just blow out through your mouth as you're doing this, it it will help. It really does help you kind of like your whole body goes, oh, okay, we're good. And we know that you guys breathe when you're playing, yeah. but, but it's- Well, it's sometimes we, we forget, yeah. you know, sometimes you're sitting there and you're just like, Ugh. But choreographed breathing, yeah. you know, if you, if you know that you're going to come in on the downbeat, then you should be breathing on four. Right, right, right. Boom, you're there. But yeah, definitely the blowing out through your mouth helps a lot as you're doing repeated stuff. It just does help you kind of settle down. So, all right. So is there anything else that we can talk about that you need help with or are we good? Um, if you guys will put your questions in the chat, I did want to ask you a question sure. when um, Christine earlier was asking about the whistly E string uh -huh. and forgive me remember that I'm a low string player I have my E string doesn't whistle <laughs> but no <laughs> I, I rarely have trouble with my E string yeah, but. Exactly. but Liz do you find that certain brands of E string whistle more than others I had an error a um a gold E string and I I, I found that I don't care for those when they're when they're gold, they for whatever reason they they maybe it's in my head. Um, I don't I don't like the difference. It was a mistake when I ordered it. It was just, I just clicked on the wrong thing and I went, oh okay, well I'm not gonna get another one right now. But um, I found I felt like it was whistling more. I don't know why. And are you talking about the ones that are literally made of gold or the Prastro gold label? The yeah, the gold label and, and, and they, they look gold, yeah. Oh, the, they look gold, that's okay. The Prastro gold label is actually silver. Oh, no, no, no I'm sorry, like, gold label, I'm sorry. But it was, I think it was a piastra that, though, that I had. It probably, Prastro's yeah. got tons of them, yeah. so yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. What do you, do you find that people um, have, you know, complain about certain ones that, that they find whistle more? What's, what's your... Yes, but, but I honestly was asking you because I don't remember what they said. I want to, yeah, and my dad may know like certain ones, um, uh -huh. but um, but the ones that are gold, gold, that yeah. I, think, I remember hearing somebody say. I, yeah. I think, now I would also, I would also ask 
when was the last time the bow hair was changed? <laughs> Seri I, honestly, and, and, and how well it has been rosined because that, that, you know, I, I've had that where I'm like, oh gosh, I, I haven't rosined it in a couple of days and I've played a lot, you know, whatever, you know, the, 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 I should have rosined it better and, and I've skipped on it or, you know, yeah, I, I got a bow hair change and it, I didn't have the problem anymore. So, um, if, if you haven't done that in a while, then, you know, go see the Huth makers and they'll take good care of you. <laughs> and, uh, but, but they're mostly it's, it, it can be the string. Um, mostly it's going to be about weight versus speed. You need a little bit more weight if you're going fast. Um, and, and maybe, uh, you know, just check the, 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 the quality of your of your bow hair and, and rosin production. Right. I'm always careful that, like I said, I'm not a violinist, but I, I do have that problem when I when I'm playing the violin. Um, I'm I'm really careful about keeping the string crossings very close mm -hmm. and not trying to come to drop too quickly to come to the E string. I try to keep the the bow almost like a double stop as close as I can to the other string. Um, that tends to reduce the the whistle um, so just just that i'm not having to move so fast and and so much right <laughs> so dion actually asked in the chat and dion is a as a volunteer teacher from trinidad so um and um she was asking about young students and string crossings if you had any help with that uh, the double stops you know to so when I, I always yeah. have my students, we're, if we're talking about string crossings, um, I'm, I always, yeah. like, I when I start teaching a piece, I have them make a checklist at the very beginning. Like, we're going to do, we got three things. Here's your checklist before we start. First thing you're going to do, and it's usually a left hand, right hand, and then whatever, counting your breathing or something. But generally, if there are string crossings involved, or even if they're not, um, and you want them to be in a certain part, I have them start off like they're doing a double stop. You put them on both strings and then barely lean over to whatever string they're, they're starting on. So they're already in the right area. So they're not having to, you know, so it doesn't look like they're pumping water. Right, and, and if there's a bow change, what Julie was talking about earlier being on different sides of the string. So if you're down bow, say on the A string and you're gonna go to the D string up bow. So you wanna be, kind of already on the D side of the, on the A string, and then you're going to, and you're right there for the D, for the D string. I take a, um, sometimes I take a cup and I should grab one, um, but just to show them what it, what it feel like the string, I'll, I'll put a cup on its side and I'll put my hand on the top and then I'll roll it like this. So you can kind of see how it, how it works. Like, so if you're stopping, you're stopping the motion, but if you're doing this with like this kind of thing, you put it on a table and you let them do it, let them roll like that to, to make the string. And so they don't have to do anything big with string crossings. It should be a very kind of a, a small motion, but they get the idea of it. And it's really cool because then the, the sound doesn't stop and they, they kind of, they get into that. That's really, that's a fun way of kind of making it away from the instrument, making it kind of real for them. So that's, um, that's very helpful when I, when I start practicing and, and doing, and I just mix it up with, the, you know, different string levels, but start double stop on between two strings and then practice that rolly thing and then go to the middle two strings and then go to the bottom two strings and adjust your, you know, I, I call it flapping your wing you know, just put the bow in the middle and then, you know, I've got crazy stuff written in all my, my students' music, you know, nose, flap, that, you know, if someone read that, they wouldn't know what, but it's that kind of, you know, flap your wing, be on the double stop, and then do the rolly thing, you know, mm -hmm. be on one side of the string or the other and, and see, and when they start doing that, the cool thing is this gets involved too. Like you, once you once you start to get this relaxed kind of flowy motion, what happens with the hand? They're not doing this. Right. They're relaxing their fingers, and they're creating this this motion, and they they don't even know they're doing it. It's like stealth teaching. It's the best. So that's what you. As long as you, if you're thinking about that stuff, that's um, it. Kind of all starts to work together. 
Anything else? Yeah, I have a question. I know I didn't, we weren't supposed to talk about this, but can you guys give um, us your best helpful hints for practicing? How long, how to approach it? How, how much you know, is too much and not enough? My, um, <laughs> I, because I, I try to practice every day, I have, and I used to do this with my own children who um, neither are professional musicians, neither will be. Um, and I told this to my students too, I'm like if you can practice 10 minutes a day, like get your instrument out and start practicing. Generally, um, most people will practice longer than 10 minutes. Um, I'm kind of one for like, make your list and get, do what you need to do. And if you can get in and out and do what you need to do and like focus hard and do it in 15, 20 minutes, great. Good, we're all busy. We have lots of stuff to do. Um, I, I just, I give myself that, that 10 minutes and sometimes that's all I get. Um, and sometimes I keep playing and I love it and it's wonderful. Um, I think for the, the two, they're, they're sort of going hand in hand. If possible, have a designated time because then it becomes routine and you're like, oh, it's, it's, and attach it to something like, oh, I'm going to, I'm going to practice for 10 minutes after I brush my teeth, whatever, you know, or after supper or what, you know, whatever it is so that it creates an expectation. And then when you're practicing kind of dovetailing what, what Julie was saying, it, um, I will identify what I'm, I'm very specific. I get very yeah down it's like an outline a very detailed outline in my in my brain of this is what i'm going to practice on these are my goals and i you know and it, it might be just two measures mm -hmm. because i have a crappy screen crossing that i you know is you know sounds horrible and i need to work on it or it could be a, a difficult uh rhythm or whatever but i you know it might be 30 measures or it might be one you know it just kind of depends but i have very specific goals and i don't worry about anything else I'm a list maker, um, so I I love to check things off my list. Even I I even check things off. I even write things down that I've already done, yep. so I can check them yep. off. Um, so when I'm practicing, I, I literally go for the and I this is really you know my private lessons. I could write about three things down and just give them a slip of paper and say, hey, pay me five thousand dollars and I'll never see you again. Just do these things because I say the same things all the time, but. When I do this, um, when I practice for myself, I just go to the parts that I can't play, you know, like that's the sound bad, cause that's good. You know, work on that part. Like you go right to the, the problem. And I do what, what my teachers called edging. Um, my teacher called it edging, I think, cause you go to the edge of the piece and you do a measure and you do it three times and then you do the next measure three times and then you put them together and then do the next measure. But some people call it linking. Um, I find that that saves me the most time of it's how I practice. I, I literally go to the stuff I can't play. I go right to the middle of it and do that. And I, my magic number is five. I do a measure five times and then I'll back up and do that measure. And, you know, I, I work it back into the piece. And, you know, by the time you've done 15 minutes, you've probably played the thing, you know, it's in your muscles. It's right. you've done the, that section 50 times if you've spent 20 minutes. So the other most thing, effective, um, I think is very important is tempo. If you don't know how to do something, you're, you know, you're learning it or it's difficult or whatever, you have to slow it down. You have to slow it down. And what I do for myself and for my students, I slow it down so that I have everything under control. That my, my bowing, my fingering, my ability to adjust men, my, my mental speed and all of that so that I'm not distracted. And they, but, but the flip side of that or the, the, yeah, the other side of the coin of that is whatever the problem is, that's where my focus is. So if, if I'm working on a fingering, you know, then I'm not worried about my right hand. And if my right hand stinks, I'm not gonna worry about it until I get my fingering under control and I'm still doing it very slow, especially with things that are new, I, if you do it slow, 
then you are giving yourself time for that muscle memory to take place. If you do it too fast and you learn it via mistakes, you have to unlearn the mistakes yeah. and then it takes relearn. More time. And so you have to, un, you know, it's it's inefficient and, and we don't have time for that. So so be <laughs> kind to yourself. Um, but but yeah, it's it's a very I I it was something that I didn't have in high school when I was really starting to get serious and, and I I I kind of learned it on my own and it's something that I share with my students and as much as I can because it saves an extraordinary amount of time if you can be that if you can be methodical about what you what you're doing and and have that I give myself three things this is what I'm going to do and I got to do it this way and blah yeah. blah blah checklist um I, I love I was reading in the comments the practice on the days that you eat <laughs> uh, I love that and you know yeah. if you're thinking that way think small bites mm -hmm. you know little 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 bits of music at a time and and really focus on them if you're concentrating hard and you can only spend five minutes great mm -hmm. then you know you've got a lot you've gotten a lot you done. did so yeah yeah so i don't know if you guys saw um and i don't know if you remember but we were talking you mentioned the holberg suite and i went <laughs> oh because my dad <laughs> taught us all the whole we did the holberg suite at ghp when we were all there together yeah. do you remember that yeah. like a thousand years ago yeah. And for those of you guys watching, my dad's sitting it up there listening to this. So it's kind of like a mini, what was that, eight, 1980? Like reunion. Yes. And you know, that piece is, I, I mean, the hair standing up on the back of my neck right now, because it's when it's done well, it's, it's so exciting. It's so awesome that we do what we do. Good yes, music, it's good music. It doesn't matter that, and, and that's the other thing that, that comes up, oh, you know, I want to play this and that and the other. You know what? Play what you want, play what you like. Yeah. Good music is good music. It doesn't matter what genre it is. It doesn't matter how simple or complex it is. Right. Good music and play what you love. If you play what you love, then you'll continue playing. It's powerful. Yeah. yeah. And people people see that. And that's, you know, when, when someone, I don't know if it was you, Anna, who, you know, how do you be beautiful? You be beautiful because you're playing music that you love. And it, and, yeah, that it, it comes out. It's very visible. And That's my favorite sentence of everything that was said tonight. <laughs> you're, you're beautiful if you just play music you love. <laughs> okay. Definitely. Awesome. Definitely. Well, if anyone has any more questions, you can throw them in there. Betsy said that she, um, that y'all, y'all suggestions were a great help and she thanked you very, very much. So um, before we do end, are either one of you taking private students because sometimes the our participants will ask and um doing zoom and stuff so um if you are if any of you guys are interested in asking questions and contacting them um Please you can certainly through. go through me and i'll send it to them they're both on facebook i think um I yeah think I am she's not, not but she's but not I see okay. her every day so yeah. i'll pass all along any message <laughs> that's you have my, you got my email yeah. in my contacts yeah. So yeah yeah we can make sure that anything you guys want to say to them gets to them for sure so and um and can i just say you guys have been amazing i learned stuff this is awesome it's everybody's so popping for you even if their cameras are off you can <laughs> i promise so, thank so. thanks well, guys we're we're flattered and very honored that we were in thank you we're happy to do this kind of thing i hope we can all be together soon and we can all like get together and just uh, play in person, yes. can't wait it's gonna happen it's, it's gonna, gonna happen. happen soon soon yes. soon definitely. yes definitely so, so. we'll look forward to that thank Me you guys too. so much thank you and thank you guys um i hope to see you all i will put the new information for the new series in um on facebook on the huffmaker Volunt's facebook page and um try and send it out to what community orchestras i know of and that kind of thing i hope to see you all you guys that have come to like six and seven eight of these i love y'all i feel like y'all are my best friends so <laughs> <laughs> so now everybody go practice yeah. right. but not for very long just a little while just have a little fun. bit just a little bit <laughs> all right good night everyone good night. i'm gonna